Hello and welcome to the fifth of our Discover SLM talks. I particularly want to extend a warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. My name is Nerida Campbell and I am the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we will be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. So keep an eye out for future talks about your favourite subject or for the incurably curious, tune in every Tuesday at 12 till 12.30 for a new topic. There'll be time for questions at the end of each talk, just to add them to the Zoom chat. Today's speaker is David White, who is currently an assistant curator whose work focuses on Elizabeth Farm and the Rouse Hill Estate in Western Sydney. David is a doctoral candidate at Macquarie University with a focus on the post-Roman royal court of Italy. He's interested in the reception of the classical world in the 19th century and its impact on modern scholarship. He is a member of the Royal Studies Network and has participated in several international archaeological excavations in the UK, Italy, Greece and Cyprus. I would like to pay my respects to the Baramadigal people of the Dara clan, past, present and future, on whose land I am presenting this talk from. For 200 years, from the mid 17th to mid 19th century, the Grand Tour was an indulgence undertaken by wealthy individuals and families who traveled to Italy in order to immerse themselves in and acquire an education in classical culture. In this talk, I'm going to present two iterations of the Grand Tour, separated by a 26 year hiatus. The first relates to the aristocratic Grand Tour, which can be said to have occurred from the mid 17th century until 1789. The second, which will cover the second and third generations of British and European Australian history, regards persons who are concerned with experiencing an idealised romantic tour of Europe, which took in the geography and landscapes of the continent as much as its history and culture. A man who has not been to Italy is always conscious of an inferiority from, not, from his not having seen what is expected a man should see. This quote taken from the journal of the English author and literary critic Samuel Johnson presents to us the principal rationale of the Grand Tour. It was a rationale born of the idea that one could obtain social prestige and capital by, ex by physically experiencing the classical past. Typically, the route taken on the Grand Tour left England via Dover and entry to Europe was made either through Calais in France or Ostend in Belgium. On arrival and with the available funds, it was usual practice for a grand tourist to hire a litany of servants, a coach if traveling overland, and a person who acted as a tutor, guide, and chaperone, who colloquially was referred to as a bear leader. Common cities that a traveler would visit included Paris, Geneva, Turin, Milan, Florence, Pisa, Padua, Bologna, and Venice. From Venice, the traveler would make their way to Rome, and for the adventurous, they would continue to Naples, and for the daring, to Sicily, Malta and Greece. Though it is impossible to give a precise date for the beginning of the Grand Tour, the earliest person to popularise what would become much of its defining features was Thomas Howard, the 14th Earl of Arundel and courtier to King James I and King James Charles I, 1603 to 1642. While acting in the capacity of a court representative in Europe, Thomas Howard collected classical artworks which he sent back to England. This practice marked the, marked the beginning of a century long habit of removing classical artworks from their original context and placing them in the collection of wealthy individuals who viewed them as tokens of acquisition rather within the true meaning in which they were originally created. Thomas Howard, however, was not a typical grand tourist. He was a political operative engaged in the same civic duties that spanned centuries into the past. What made a grand tourist different from the diplomats, clergy, merchants, soldiers and pilgrims that had traveled from the British Isles to Europe was that a grand tourist did so for leisure, not through a sense of obligation. By the early 18th century, 
young English aristocrats were flocking to Europe to undertake the grand tour. Many were inspired by published literature, such as Joseph Addison's popular theatrical play, Cato, A Tragedy, Jonathan Richardson's An Account of the Statues, Base Reliefs, Drawings and Pictures in Italy, and the nascent excavations of Pompeii. However, a sinister aspect soon emerged and the myth of the Grand Tour as an enlightening educational experience became tinged with national, nationalist ideology and notions of cultural superiority. Racist stereotypes such as lazy Italians, Catholic superstition and loose moral women began to infect conceptions of Italy. The idea that Italy had a glorious past but the gated present became a popular perception amongst the Grand Tourists. The brief hiatus in travel to Europe to account for the Seven Years' War between 1756 and 1763 did little to stop Grand Tourists travelling to Italy. Indeed, from 1764, it was done so with greater vigour, and it was during this later period that Italy was stripped of its greatest classical treasures. One of the more infamous procurers of classical antiquities was Thomas Jenkins, who though trained as an artist, was more of a tour guide who could acquire classical artworks for the right price. Furthermore, Thomas Jenkins acted as a banker for the English in Rome, enjoyed the patronage and confidence of Pope Clement XIV, and on the side was an English spy keeping an eye on Scottish Jacobites in Rome. Thomas Jenkins was responsible for the removal of some of the most famous artworks of antiquity, including a virgin of the Discabolos discovered in the villa of the Emperor Hadrian at Tivoli, the Barbini Venus, and the so-called Matai collection, which had belonged to one of the most significant Italian families of the middle and early modern ages. Thomas Jenkins can be seen as the pinnacle of the first iteration of the Grand Tour. His death in 1797 was preceded by his escape from Italy just prior to its occupation by the French army. Just six years later, in 1803, the British and French resumed hostilities, which, were an, which originated as a hangover from the Seven Years' War. What quickly became the French dominance of Europe severed British access to the continent. Importantly, for this presentation, the French dominance of Europe had an impact on two of the properties cared for by Sydney Living Museums. Both Elizabeth Farm and Rousseau Estate were, no, were in no small way affected by the events in Europe of the first two decades of the 19th century. I'm sure many of you are aware that John Carver, who built Elizabeth Farm, made a good part of his fortune from the marina wool trade. If it were not for the French dominance of Europe and the difficulty for the English obtaining Spanish merino wool from the continent, John MacArthur would never have been granted sheep from the royal flock and 5,000 prime acres in what is today Camden. Indeed, it was MacArthur's success along with his antagonistic mannerisms that led to the, the deposal of Governor Bly in 1808. The removal of Governor Bly sharply divided the colony and one of the persons who supported Bly was Richard Rouse, then a superintendent of public works in Parramatta. Following the arrival of Governor Macquarie in late 1809, those who had supported Bly were duly rewarded with government favours, and one of these acts, Richard Rouse was promised and later granted land where Rouse Hill Estate now sits. Following the conclusion of the Napoleonic War in 1815, British tourists flocked back to Europe. When peace came after many long years of war, when our island prison was open to us and our watery exit was declared practicable, it was the paramount wish of every English heart to hasten to the continent and to imitate our forefathers in their almost forgotten fashion of spending the greater part of their lives and fortunes in their carriages on the post roads of the continent. Certainly, a sense of being British, or at least belonging to the orbit of the British Empire, was pervasive amongst the colonists of New South Wales, and it is evident that the lure of international travel, especially to Europe, was paramount, paramount among those who could afford it. The pull to Europe was heightened by the advances in sailing technologies and a continuous increase in the number of persons arriving in New South Wales. Aboard these ships, especially following the assisted passage schemes that began in the 1830s, were individuals and families seeking to increase their social position by acquiring vast tracts of land beyond the Blue Mountains. 
With these persons came a taste of the neoclassical that had entered Britain via the Grand Tour. A pertinent example of such a person is John Verge, who was the principal architect of Sydney Living Museum's own Elizabeth Bay House. Examples of other significant residents not under our care is Camden Park House, designed for John MacArthur, and Subiaco at Rydalmere, which was built for Hannibal MacArthur, but has unfortunately long been demolished. Amongst the object collection of Sydney, Sydney Living Museums are multiple examples of the effect the Grand Tour had on the decorative taste of the colonial community of New South Wales. For those who travelled to England prior to the construction of the Suez Canal in 1859, the journey was an arduous endeavour that usually saw ships sail east around the southern island of New Zealand, making their way through the dangerous southern ocean, around Cape Horn and north through the Atlantic. Once arrived, it would be, these would-be grand tourists departed England as per tradition from Dover. However, once arrived, unlike their earlier predecessors, grand tourists of the middle 19th century were informed by guidebooks and a well-developed industry that was on the cusp of the modern tourist age. Uh, let me now share with you a few examples from the collection of Sydney Living Museums of objects and artworks that were collected during the Grand Tour. In this first example, acquired by Hannah Rouse in 1869, we find a cameo depicting the first Roman Emperor Augustus. It is modelled after the so-called Blackest cameo that now resides in the British Museum. As you can see in the comparison with the original Augustus in the in the modern cameo is stripped of the imperial diadem and gone are the images of the pagan deities that he worshiped. In execution, the modern artist has preferred delicate features and an emphasis on curvature that is absent in the original. The original you will, no the original you will notice displays a harder look and a more authoritative expression. What remains in the 19th century cameo is an echo of Augustus, an image that is tame and devoid of its original meaning it now sits comfortably within the expectations and aesthetics of 19th century British society. In this second example, also from the collection of Hannah Rouse, is a photograph of the Arch of Constantine. The photograph is a copy that appeared in a book of photographs published in several iterations in the early 1860s by the Scottish photographer Robert McPherson. What is of interest here is that the photograph is devoid of local inhabitants. Rome, as it always had been, was a bustling city in the 19th century, home to upwards of one million people. The absence of any person in this photograph is therefore striking. In order to achieve this feat, Robert McPherson and other co commercial photographers catering to the Grand Tourists took their photographs early in the morning so as not to capture any locals who, granted, may have caused a distinct blurring, but also may have revealed the abject poverty that many local Romans suffered in this period. For the well-heeled traveller, poverty was the antithesis to the splendour of the Grand Tour. This photo reminds us of an earlier quote in this talk, Italy, a glorious past, but degraded present. This third example of an artwork collected during the Grand Tour, which now hangs at Walclaw House, is of a theme from the classical era, but produced much later in the early 16th century. It is a tight and heavily redacted, reduced depiction of the Sistine Madonna, which was painted by the artist Raphael for the Church of St. Sisto in Picanza. Its subject is a youthful Christ presented to the viewer by his mother Mary. In the original, to her left, with his arms outstretched, is Pope Sixtus III, and to her right, kneels St. Barbara. Below these figures, Raphael painted two emphatically bored, but nonetheless very cute cherubs who adorned countless consumer products throughout the 19th century. Seen in the context of the Wentworth drawing room, it is a beautiful decorative art piece. Unfortunately, taken out of its original context, its subtle meaning is lost. For example, you'll notice that the young Christ points down, where in its original sat setting, an altar sat. Secondly, the child's eyes are open, which in a Renaissance context signified the resurrection. A 16th century viewer cognizant in Catholic teachings would have immediately recognized these features. Furthermore, in the original, the viewer is an integral element of the painting. They are a participant drawn into an interaction with the young Christ 
by the outstretched hand of Pope Sixtus III. These meanings, however, are lost when hung in a wealthy Protestant drawing room. The painting is viewed not so much for its religious connotations, but rather for the artistic skill of one of the greatest painters of the Renaissance era. This bronze equestrian statuette is displayed, is displayed within the hallway of Walpole's house and depicts the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, AD 161 to 180. It is a copy of a much larger bronze statue that until 1981 occupied a central position in the Piazza del Compadalio and is held within the Museum Capiglione. This statue is another example of the art and furniture that, would, that was acquired by the Wentworth family during their continental tour of Europe in the early 1850s. The, the original bronze statue was created in the late second century when the Romans believed they had pacified the Germanic tribes located, north on, located along the north side of the Danube River. With his hands outstretched, the emperor is depicted in a gesture of clementa, pacification. It is a peaceful act performed by a victor who generously grants mercy to those whom he believed were defeated. Additionally, Marcus Aurelius wears a, pal a paladantium, a military cloak, and his feet are covered by an aristocratic style footwear known as the calci patrici. The base on which the emperor and horse sit is a much later edition produced in the 16th century by the artist Michelangelo for Pope Paul III. A person viewing the original statue in the second century would immediately have recognized and celebrated the occasion for which the statue was created. However, as a 19th century collector's piece, it is presented in a much diminished state, reduced in size and has lost much of its impact. It is now simply an adornment to be acquired and displayed, highlighting the fact that the owner had the economic and social means to embark upon the grand tour and was able to prove it by showing off what they had acquired. This next and last example I will show is another acquisition acquired by the Rouse family from Italy. In this picture, you can see that it sits on the mantle of the sitting room at Rouse Hill Estate. It is a copy of the so-called Barbini Venus which if you recall, was acquired by the British uh, procurer of art and spy, Thomas Jenkins. The subject of this statue is the Roman goddess Venus, whose association with love and beauty was a defining feature of the Grand Tour. The discovery of the original statue is shrouded in mystery, is shrouded in mystery as is the amount of restoration or indeed additions to the statue. It is certain that the head, though ancient, is a modern addition, as are the arms, in fact, in its original state, the nakedness of the goddess was in full view, alluring to the story of her birth. In fact, it is very likely that this was the reason Thomas Jenkins was able to get permission to export the statue from Italy. In England, there too, it was considered inappropriate to display the full body of the goddess, and the arms were sculptured in such a way as to cover her body. In doing so, of course, the impact and narrative of her birth is completely lost on the modern viewer. So indeed, what was the mythology of the Grand Tour? The mythology of the Grand Tour is that it was an exercise in interpreting and understanding classical culture. Much of its educational and refining qualities very quickly gave way to nationalist ideology. It is no coincidence that the Grand Tour and interest in the most famous empire of Europe coincided with the rise of the British Empire. This quote by the architectural historian Siegfried Gideon offers an excellent summary. History is not simply the repository of unchanging facts, but a process, a pattern of living and changing attitudes and interpretations. The backward look transforms the object, every spectator, at every period, at every moment, indeed, inevitably transforms the past according to his own nature. History cannot be touched without changing it. The Grand Tour was nothing more than an, was no more an experience of the classical world than that felt by the modern tourist. From the 17th to the 19th century, the Grand Tour reflected present society. Each statue, artifact and landscape was experienced through the prism of contemporary ideology. The great myth of the Grand Tour, what is it? The great myth of the Grand Tour was that it was anything but a contemporary indulgence. Taking out of context the original meaning of the art and objects acquired by these tourists are lost and are indeed irretrievable. 
they speak a new language, one that is deaf to the classical world, but boasts loudly of the emergent modern world and the persons who occupy it. Thank you. Thank you, David, that was fascinating. I have to ask the first question myself. I'm fascinated by the objects in the Sydney Living Museum's collection that relate to the Grand Tour. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's your favourite? Oh, my favourite object. I do quite enjoy the Sistine Madonna, actually. Um, it's a beautiful art piece. It actually now resides in Germany. It has quite a history itself, um, travelling to Germany in the 19th century. Um, it's imbued with so many nuances um, and interpretations um, that you could look at it for, for hours and hours. And of course, a painting by Raphael, you know, one of the, the geniuses. Um, of course, it's a, it's a magnificently beautiful painting. Thank you. Just having a look at the chat, to see if we've got any more questions coming in. There's a lot of people who really enjoyed your talk and found the subject really interesting. The ring that you used um, to advertise this talk, can you tell me a little bit more about it and which collection that was from? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's from the Rouse Hill Estate Collection. So it belonged to Hannah Rouse. Um, she likely acquired it in Italy uh, when the and herself um, and two of her children attended the Grand Tour. Um, by the, the later half of the 19th century, the Grand Tour had changed somewhat from its earlier iteration. In its earlier iteration, it was aristocratic men taking it. By the later 19th century, families were, were going for it, um, were taking the Grand Tour. Um, it's a, a cameo, as I mentioned, of the Emperor Augustus. Uh, he fits into a 19th century narrative and especially a a Christian idea that's pervasive amongst British society at the time, because uh, he was emperor at the time that, that Christ was born. So the idea developed that the most famous Roman emperor uh, and Christ being born at the same time were, were somewhat linked to each other. Um, so it was a very important feature for people in the 19th century. Thank you. So we have a question from Helen and she said, um, having an original artwork wasn't crucial to the Grand Tourer. Knockoffs were just as desirable. She had a question around that. Were they just as desirable? Are they, by the time we start getting knockoffs and copies and, and things of that nature, um, in Italy and around Europe, um, as it started changing into, into the modern age, I guess there was a lot more laws um, and the people wanting to keep the objects in their country. So you start getting this industry developing up of developing copies. And they're great copies. They're, you know, you can almost put them side by side with each other. And some of the masters from the 19th century did fantastic work. So it's how, so it's how you feel when viewing a copy. If you find it um, pleasing, if you enjoy viewing the copy, well, then that's fine. That's, you know, that's, that's brilliant. That's fantastic. You don't need the original to feel the same way, perhaps about the subject. Um, so, but in the earlier period, um, in your oh, 17th and 18th century, certainly, they are taking the originals out because there aren't those export laws there. There's not the desire by the, the Italians or even the Greeks or you know, these kind of people to keep the objects at that time in their country. Now, another question from Steve. Um, he said, I remember your formal rooms and statues and pictures tour of Vaucluse House. It was a very good tour indeed. I was wondering if you had any of that tour written down. Any of my tour of all Clues House? Yes, the uh, the tour oh. with the statues and pictures. Um, what those tours, and it's still similar when we go out to Rouse and, and E Farm and, and all those properties, you don't have it written down, but you certainly get into a pattern and you know what you're talking about. And sometimes, you know, when you end up doing three or four tours a day, sometimes you, you get confused with yourself because you're repeating so much. So while it's not written down, it's certainly in all VIOs, visitor interpretation officers, the, spe the speech is in your head. And it's remembered quite well. Thank you. Another bit of enthusiasm to hear that really brings our talk today to its conclusion. Um, I would like to invite our audience to join us on Thursday at four o'clock for one of our History Reflected tours where Dr. Carlin de Montfort is going to be searching the records for Sir Charles Kingsford Smith 
And next Tuesday at 12 o'clock, Dr. Jackie Ewing is going to be sharing um, her thoughts on uh, cooking with Rose Seidler. Hope you can join us then. Thank you.